Chapter Four, Section One of A Chronicle of the Pontiac War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Venditti. A Chronicle of the Pontiac War by Thomas Guthrie Marquis. Chapter Four, Section One: The Siege of Detroit. At the time of the Pontiac outbreak. There were in the vicinity of Fort Detroit between one thousand and two thousand white inhabitants. Yet the place was little more than a wilderness post. The settlers were cut off from civilization and learned news of the great world outside only in the spring, when the traders' boats came with supplies. They were out of touch with Montreal and Quebec, and it was difficult for them to realize that they were subject of the hated King of England. They had not lost their confidence that the armies of France would yet be victorious and sweep the British from the Great Lakes, and in this opinion they were strengthened by traders from the Mississippi, who came among them. But the change of rulers had made little difference in their lives. The majority of them were employed by traders, and the better class contentedly cultivated their narrow farms and traded with the Indians who periodically visited them. The settlement was widely scattered, extending along the east shore of the Detroit River for about eight miles from Lake St. Clair, and along the west shore for about six miles, four above and two below the fort. On either side of the river, the fertile fields and the long row of whitewashed, low-built houses, with their gardens and orchards of apple and pear trees, fenced about with rounded pickets, presented a picture of peace and plenty. The summers of the inhabitants were enlivened by the visits of the Indians and the traders, and in winter they lightheartedly whiled away the tedious hours with gossip and dance and feast, like the inhabitants along the Rochelieu and St. Lawrence. The militia of the settlement, as we have seen, had been deprived of their arms at the taking over of Detroit by Robert Rogers, and for the most part the settlers maintained a stolid attitude toward their conquerors, from whom they suffered no hardship, and whose rule was not galling. The British had nothing to fear from them, but the Indians were a force to be reckoned with. There were three Indian villages in the vicinity, the Wyandot, on the east side of the river, opposite the fort, the Ottawa, five miles above, opposite Isle au Cochon, Belle Isle, and the Potawatomi, about two miles below the fort, on the west shore. The Ottawas here could muster two hundred warriors, the Potawatomis about one hundred and fifty, and the Wyandots two hundred and fifty, while near at hand were the Chippewas three hundred and twenty strong. Pontiac, although head chief of the Ottawas, did not live in the village, but had his wigwam on Isle à la Peche, at the outlet of Lake St. Clair, a spot where whitefish abounded. Here he dwelt with his squaws and papooses not in grandeur, but in squalid savagery. Between the Indians and the French there existed a most friendly relationship, many of the inhabitants, indeed, having Indian wives. Near the center of the settlement, on the west bank of the river, about twenty miles from Lake Erie, stood Fort Detroit, a miniature town. It was in the form of a parallelogram, and was surrounded by a palisade twenty-five feet high. According to a letter of an officer, the walls had an extent of over one thousand paces. At each corner was a bastion, and over each gate a blockhouse. Within the walls were about one hundred houses. The little Catholic church of St. Anne's, a council house, officers' quarters, and a range of barracks. Save for one or two exceptions, the buildings were of wood, thatched with bark or straw, and stood close together. The streets were exceedingly narrow, but immediately within the palisade, a wide road extended round the entire village. The spiritual welfare of the French and Indian Catholics in the garrison was looked after by Father Portier, a Jesuit, whose mission was in the Wyandotte village, and by Father Bacot, a recollect who lived within the fort. Major Henry Gladwin was in command. He had a hundred and twenty soldiers and two armed schooners. The Gladwin and the Beaver were in the river nearby. On the first day of May, 1763, Pontiac came to the main gate of the fort asking to be allowed to enter, as he and the warriors with him, forty in all, desired to show their love for the British by dancing the calumet or peace dance. 
Gladwin had not the slightest suspicion of evil intent, and readily admitted them. The savages selected a spot in front of the officers' houses, and thirty of them went through their grotesque movements, shouting and dancing to the music of the Indian drum, and all the while waving their calumets in token of friendship. While the dancers were thus engaged, the remaining ten of the party were busily employed in surveying the fort, noting the number of men and the strength of the palisades. The dance lasted about an hour. Presents were then distributed to the Indians, and all took their departure. Pontiac now summoned the Indians about Detroit to another council. On this occasion, the chiefs and warriors assembled in the council house in the Potawatomi village south of the fort. When all were gathered together, Pontiac rose and, as at the council at the river Courses, in a torrent of words and with vehement gestures, denounced the British. He declared that under the new occupancy of the forts in the Indian country, the red men were neglected and their wants were no longer supplied as they had been in the days of the French, and exorbitant prices were charged by the traders for goods that when the Indians were departing for their winter camps to hunt for furs, they were no longer able to obtain ammunition and clothing on credit, and finally, that the British desired the death of the Indians, and it was therefore necessary as an act of self-preservation to destroy them. He once more displayed the war belt that he pretended to have received from the King of France. This belt told him to strike in his own interest and in the interest of the French. He closed his speech by saying that he had sent belts to the Chippewas of Saginaw and the Ottawas of Michalomacac, and of the river La Treche, the Thames, saying that his words were greeted with grunts and shouts of approval, and that the assembled warriors were with him to a man. Pontiac revealed a plan he had formed to seize the fort and slaughter the garrison. He and some fifty chiefs and warriors would wait on Gladwin on the pretense of discussing matters of importance. Each one would carry beneath his blanket a gun, with the barrel cut short to permit of concealment. Warriors and even women were to enter the fort as if on a friendly visit and take up positions of advantage in the streets, in readiness to strike with tomahawks, knives, and guns, all which they were to have concealed beneath their blankets. At the council, Pontiac was to address Gladwin and, in pretended friendship, hand him a wampum belt. If it were wise to strike, he would, on presenting the belt, hold its reverse side towards Gladwin. This was to be the signal for attack. Instantly, blankets were to be thrown aside and the officers were to be shot down. At the sound of firing in the council room, the Indians in the streets were to fall on the garrison and every British soldier was to be slain care being taken that no Frenchman suffered. The plan, by its treachery, and by its possibilities of slaughter and plunder, appealed to the savages, and they dispersed to make preparations for the morning of the seventh, the day chosen for carrying out the murderous scheme. The plot was difficult to conceal. The aid of French blacksmiths had to be sought to shorten the guns. Moreover, the British garrison had some friends among the Indians. Scarcely had the plot been matured when it was discussed among the French, and on the day before the intended massacre it was revealed to Gladwin. His informant is not certainly known. A Chippewa maiden, an old squaw, several Frenchmen, and an Ottawa named Manghi have been mentioned. It is possible that Gladwin had it from a number of sources, but most likely from Mahagini. The Pontiac manuscript, probably the work of Robert Nevere, the keeper of the notorial records of the settlement, distinctly states that Magahini revealed the details of the plot with the request that Gladwin should not divulge his name, for should Pontiac learn, the informer would surely be put to death. This would account for the fact that Gladwin, even in his report of the affair to Amherst, gave no hint as to the person who told him. Gladwin at once made preparations to receive Pontiac and his chiefs, on the night of the 6th, instructions were given to the soldiers and the traders within the fort to make preparations to resist an attack, and the guards were doubled. As the sentries peered out into the darkness, occasional yells and whoops and the beating of drums reached their ears. 
telling of the war dance that was being performed in the Indian villages to hearten the warriors for the slaughter. Gladwin determined to act boldly. On the morning of the 7th, all the trader's stores were closed, and every man capable of bearing weapons was under arms. But the gates were left open as usual, and shortly after daylight, Indians and squaws by twos and threes began to gather in the forts as if to trade. At ten in the morning, a line of chiefs with Pontiac at their lead filed along the road leading to the river gate. All were painted and plumed, and each one was wrapped in a brightly colored blanket. When they entered the fort, they were astonished to see the warlike preparation, but stoically concealed their surprise. Arrived in the council chamber, the chiefs noticed the sentinels standing at arms. The commandant and his officers seated, their faces stern and set, pistols in their belts and swords by their sides. So perturbed were the chiefs by all this warlike display that it was some time before they would take their seats on the mats prepared for them. At length they recovered their composure, and Pontiac broke the silence by asking why so many of the young men were standing in the streets with their guns. Answer was made through the interpreter, Le Butte, that it was for exercise and discipline. Pontiac then addressed Gladwin, vehemently protesting friendship. All the time he was speaking, Gladwin bent on him a scrutinizing gaze, and as the chief was about to present the wampum belt, a signal was given and the drums crashed out a charge. Every doubt was removed from Pontiac's mind. His plot was discovered. His nervous hand lowered the belt, but he recovered himself immediately and presented it in the ordinary way. Gladwin replied to his speech sternly, but kindly, saying that he would have the protection and friendship of the British so long as he merited it. A few presents were then distributed among the Indians, and the council ended. The chiefs, with their blankets still tightly wrapped about them, filed out of the council room and scattered to their villages followed by the disappointed rabble of fully three hundred Indians who had assembled in the fort. On the morrow, Pontiac, accompanied by three chiefs, again appeared at the fort, bringing with him a pipe of peace. When this had been smoked by the officers and chiefs, he presented it to Captain Campbell as a further mark of friendship. The next day he was once more at the gate seeking entrance, but he found them closed. Gladwin felt that the time had come to take no chances. This morning a rebel of Potawamis, Ottawas, Wyandots, and Chippewas thronged the common just outside of Musket Range. On Pontiac's request for a conference with Gladwin, he was sternly told that he might enter alone. The answer angered him, and he strode back to his followers. Now with yells and war-hoops, parties of the savages bounded away on a murderous mission. Half a mile behind the fort, an Englishwoman, Mrs. Turnbill, and her two sons cultivated a small farm. All three were straightaway slain. A party of Ottawas leapt into their canoes and paddled swiftly to Isle Auchjon, where lived a former sergeant, James Fisher. Fisher was seized, killed, and scalped. His young wife brutally murdered, and their two little children carried into captivity. On this same day, news was brought to the fort that Sir Robert Davers and Captain Robertson had been murdered three days before on Lake St. Clair by Chippewas who were on their way from Saginaw to join Pontiac's forces. Thus began the Pontiac War in the vicinity of Detroit. For several months the garrison was to no little rest. That night at the Ottawa village arose the hideous din of the war dance, and while the warriors worked themselves into a frenzy, the squaws were busy breaking camp. Before daylight, the village was moved to the opposite side of the river, and the wigwams were pitched near the mouth of Parents Creek, about a mile and a half above the fort. On the morning of the tenth the siege began in earnest. Shortly after daybreak, the yells of a horde of savages could be heard north and south and west, but few of the enemy could be seen, as they had excellent shelter behind barns, outhouses, and fences. For six hours they kept up a continuous fire on the garrison but wounded only five men. The fort vigorously returned the fire, and none of the enemy dared attempt to rush the palisades. A cluster of buildings in the rear sheltered a particularly ferocious set of savages. A three-pounder, the only effective artillery in the fort, was trained on this position. 
Spikes were bound together with wire, heated red-hot, and fired at the buildings. These were soon a mass of flames, and the savages concealed behind them fled for their lives. Presently the Indians grew tired of this useless warfare and withdrew to their villages. Gladwin, thinking that he might bring Pontiac to terms, sent Le Butte to ask the cause of the attack and to say that the British were ready to redress any wrongs from which the Indians might be suffering. Le Butte was accompanied by Jean Baptiste Chapton, a captain of the militia, and a man of some importance in the fort, and Jacques Godfrey, a traitor and likewise an officer of militia. It may be noted that Godfrey's wife was the daughter of a Miami chief. The ambassadors were received in a friendly manner by Pontiac, who seemed ready to cease hostilities. La Butte returned to the fort with some of the chiefs to report progress, but when he went again to Pontiac he found that the Ottawa chief had made no definite promise. It seems probable, judging from their later actions, that Chapaton and Godfrey had betrayed Gladwin and urged Pontiac to force the British out of the country. Pontiac now requested that Captain Donald Campbell, who had been in charge of Detroit before Gladwin took over the command, should come to his village to discuss terms. Campbell was confident that he could pacify the Indians, and, accompanied by Lieutenant George McDougall, he set out along the river road for the Ottawa's encampment at Parents Creek. As the two officers crossed the bridge at the mouth of the creek, they were met by a savage crowd, men, women, and children, armed with sticks and clubs. The mob rushed at them with yells and threatening gestures, and were about to fall on the officers when Pontiac appeared, and restored order. A council was held, but as Campbell could get no satisfaction, he suggested returning to the fort. Thereupon Pontiac remarked, "'My father will sleep to-night in the lodges of his red children.' Campbell and MacDougall were given good quarters in the house of Jean-Baptiste Moloche. For nearly two months they were to be kept close prisoners. So far only part of the Wyandots had joined Pontiac. Father Portier had been trying to keep his flock neutral, but on the eleventh Pontiac crossed to the Wyandot village and threatened it with destruction, if the warriors did not take up the tomahawk. On this compulsion they consented, no doubt glad of an excuse to be rid of the discipline of their priest. Another attack on the fort was made, this time by about six hundred Indians, but it was futile as the one of the earlier day. Pontiac now tried negotiation. He summoned Gladwin to surrender, promising that the British should be allowed to depart unmolested on their vassals. The officers, knowing that their communications with the east were cut, that food was scarce, that a vigorous assault could not fail to carry the fort, urged Gladwin to accept the offer. But he sternly refused. He would not abandon Detroit while one pound of food and one pound of powder were left in the fort. Moreover, the treacherous conduct of Pontiac convinced him that the troops and traders as they left the fort would be plundered and slaughtered. He rejected Pontiac's demand and advised him to disperse his people and save his ammunition for hunting. At this critical moment Detroit was undoubtedly saved by a French-Canadian, but for Jacques Baby, the grim specter, starvation would have stalked through the little fortress. Baby was a prosperous trader and merchant who, with his wife Suzanne Riom, lived on the east shore of the river, almost opposite the fort. He had a farm of one thousand acres, two hundred of which were under cultivation. His trading establishment was a low-built log structure, eighty feet long by twenty wide. He owned thirty slaves, twenty men, and ten women. He seems to have treated them kindly at any rate. Their loyalty did his will. Baby agreed to get provisions into the fort by stealth and on a dark night, about a week after the siege commenced, Gladwin had a lantern displayed on a plank fixed at the water's edge. Baby had six canoes in readiness. In each were stowed two quarters of beef, three hogs, and six bags of meal. All night long these canoes plied across the half-mile stretch of water, and by daylight sufficient food to last the garrison for several weeks had been delivered. End of chapter 4, section 1